Hello everyone and welcome to today's seminar. Um, today our topic is uh, what do businesses what do business leaders really want from procurement? So we've been joined by some experts today to share their experiences on how they've influenced board members, CEOs, COOs, etc., and really put procurement in a prominent place in their organisations. Some of them are still on their journey. Uh, there's there's still always loads to go, but hopefully you'll go away with some tips today on on how to start um, in your organisations. This is first in a series of seminars that we are doing, and we're lucky enough to be joined today by. By RS Components who are supporting us with these uh, seminars. Uh, more details will come right at the end on how to join the others that are coming in the up and coming months on different topics but we'll cover that a bit later. So I'm delighted to um, introduce Mike England, Chief Operating Officer from RS Components who's joining us today. Mike, thanks very much for supporting us on these uh, seminars and lots of other things that you support SIPs on too. It's great to have you here. Yeah, um, thanks very much Emma and um, quite a lot of topics relating to procurement as well with um, with the COVID-19 situation globally, with Brexit, with uh, the elections in the Americas. I'm sure that uh, procurement people around the world are asking some tough questions <laughs> right now. Yes, I'm sure that all eyes are on them from their board members. So it's a really great opportunity really to start really thinking about how you position yourself well in your organisations. So, um, Mike, uh, tell me a bit about your role at RS and um, and how your career path has gone. Yeah, sure. Um, well, look, great to meet you all this morning, and um, and uh, you know, I hope you get some uh, great um, information and, and some great ideas out of the conversations. And, and please make sure we're all interactive and have some great discussions and ask all the questions that you can. Uh, from my side, um, I'm the chief operating officer at uh, Electric Components. We trade as RS Components uh, in Europe and Asia Pac and we trade as allied uh, in the Americas. Um, we are a global omni-channel solutions provider, um, supplying well, millions, literally millions of electronic and industrial products and components into a broad range of industry segments um, around the world. Um, and uh, we're working with over 2,500 um, suppliers globally, uh, which is complex um, because they operate, um, uh, they operate in different ways around the world and we have to navigate how we work with, with them. Um, we uh, very, very much um, feel that procurement um, sits right at the heart of, of any business and uh, something that I'm a, an evangelist for. So I'm looking forward to giving my thoughts on that as a leader. My, my accountability, I've got full uh, PL accountability across um, our three regions of Europe, um, of, of the US and, uh, and Asia. Um, so that means that I look after sales, marketing, digital transformation, innovation, procurement, category management, supplier management. Um, really at the middle of all of that is customer experience and how do we all yeah. focus on creating an amazing customer experience and I think everything you know, needs to be channeled in that way and increasingly as, as we all know you know and certainly across all of our executive team being an evangelist for ESG and thinking about you know how do we continuously improve the way that we do business to support um, you know a safer um, and more, more efficient and, and, uh, and viable world. Um, I'm an engineer by background, so I love to understand how things work. And, um, you know, in, in my role now, it's actually a lot about how organizations work and how to connect teams together. And I think that that will be a theme, I'm sure, that will come out very strongly. I'm an absolute passionate leader um, around creating high performance teams. Um, I love diversity. Um, and most importantly, you know, how do you break down barriers in business? How do you get teams working together um, you know, so that we're thinking about the the competition and and, uh, and our customers on the outside and all focusing together um, for a common good on the inside. I will profess, Emma, I'm not a procurement expert, but I have spent 25 years working with customers across multiple segments and suppliers, and most of my interfaces being in commercial roles have been procurement. So um, I'm also married to um, a wonderful lady who um, has has come from a very strong procurement background, so that keeps me in check as well. So that's just a little bit about myself. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and um, you must have come across lots of procurement teams during your um, career. Do you think that they've necessarily had the focus that they should be getting to unleash their full potential? No, I don't. And I, and I, I do feel at times that um, you know, it, it can be a forgotten part of a business or it can be seen as being the, the, that team in the centre that keep telling us what to do. Um, but the reality is, is that um, you know, procurement 
um, is becoming absolutely critical to um, to you know, the success of any organisation. And you know, the last six months have only demonstrated how important you know procurement is, not just in terms of the financial benefits, but actually ensuring that the source of supply, the quality of supply, the, the ethnic nature of the supply, um, you know, is all absolutely in check. And I think that's only been exasperated um, through through this um, pandemic. But for, for us as a business, you know, we, we almost have to also break down procurement in a number of areas. You know, for us, we're dealing with you know, two and a half thousand plus suppliers um, where we're buying from them um, to create our offer to our customers. And yeah. so that requires not just you know, competitive buying and, and, and negotiation, but it requires true partnership. Um, you know, so a you know, big believer in win-win relationships rather than win-lose. Um, you know, that's critical. And in fact, win-win-win. You know, how do we create value for the, for the supplier, for ourselves, but most importantly for the customer, because our customers are also our suppliers' customers and, and vice versa. Um, you know, we have a, a significant number of partners that we deal with, either on the technology side or the digital side, and it could be to do with marketing and increasingly you know, ecosystems and partnerships are really important, but all of that requires procurement, you know, yeah. to make sure that we're keeping each other honest. In those relationships and then finally you know we've got over six thousand people worldwide and how do we procure the right infrastructure so that they have the tools the enablers that they have the equipment to keep them safe in the work that they do so for me you know it's, it's how do you blend in my experience not just with for my own role but looking at other companies how do you blend you know allowing that localized entrepreneurial spirit of the businesses and the business units with delivering real economies of scale um, for an organization. And of course, the bigger the organization and, and the more multi, multinational that becomes, the, the more complex that becomes. And that presents some really interesting debates about organizational design. It comes down to culture and ways of working, you know, and, you know, have, have the leaders in the business got an aligned view of the importance of procurement and therefore how, do, how is that achieved? Um, for me, if I, if, if I create an example just briefly and then we can move on. Um, I always think it's good for, 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 for um, different, different teams like procurement to think about the challenges that other teams face. So I've done quite a lot of work um, around digital transformation. And if you think about digital, you know, in an immature state, it tends to be very much a function linked to technology. And it can be seen as being a few people you know, responsible for that digital stuff. Whereas true digital transformation is that it has to become part and parcel of everybody's responsibility yeah. and actually you realize that you can't succeed to create data you know, digital technology you know first business unless everything is connected and i think it's exactly the same with procurement and you know to summarize how do you move from being siloed and quite separate and being seen as a as a team to becoming connected and interlinked around the organization how do you go from uh, a, a kind of a low level of importance to being an imperative um, to the success of the organization how do you move from being what's seen as a few people to actually embedding, you know, procurement excellence and mindset, you know, across the whole organization. How do you become less invisible to become highly visible? And that in the end comes down to great communication, celebrating successes, getting wins, but it's got to be combined with the, with the business owners, with the PL owners, so that we're, we're creating value together. Those will be some of my thoughts just to get the conversation started. And I guess as as when things all work very smoothly, um, things do become a little bit more invisible because you know you don't really notice it when things are, are running all ship shape. And I guess um, nothing's been ship shape the last um, six months or so. So um, I suspect all eyes have been on procurement teams recently. Um, thanks, Mike. I'm going to introduce the rest of the panel now. We're joined by. Um, uh, Carol Williams, who's um, Head of Procurement at Europe for Lang O'Rourke, and Simon Lee, who's Procurement and Supply Chain Director for Whitbread. Welcome both. Morning, how are you? Morning, everyone. Hello. Or afternoon, um, wherever you are in the world. Yes, quite. <laughs> um, and for the delegates, we're going to have a little panel session now. So I've got lots of questions for our panel. But please, um, as Mike said, um, submit your, your questions into the, the Q&A box. Um, we'd like to make this session as interactive as possible to make sure that all of your questions are answered by the time we've finished today. And also, please um, join in with the chat, make this interactive um, chat with other delegates and let us know what you think about some of the issues that we're going to be covering today. So following on from uh, Mike's comments there, um, 
if you could just share a bit about um, your experiences of um, selling the value of, of procurement in, in your organisations. And I guess this is, um, you've had lots of experience in different organisations and some sectors have, have probably been much harder than others. So uh, Carol, I don't know if you want to go first and share some experiences you've had. Yes, of course, I've had quite a varied career. Um, I actually started off as a teenager in the Ministry of Defence buying missiles, which when I went home for tea that night and told my mother what my new job was, she was quite terrified. Um, but I've kind of moved through a number of different roles and happily I've now arrived in the construction industry. Um, I feel like the rest of my career was a dress rehearsal for this moment. Um, so having walked in lots of different shoes, I think Mike's point about understanding your stakeholders is really important. You know, if you've been a project leader, then you can really appreciate what project leaders value from a procurement organisation. I do think it's about a team sport. Uh, we have a part to play. We're an entrusted part of the team. So much of what the business relies on, a lot of businesses, supply chain um, is about 60 or 70 percent of their turnover. So we really are entrusted to act with integrity and authenticity to build those really strong relationships for the benefit of the whole team. Um, where I started in terms of my more recent appointment in the construction industry with Lango Rock is to align to the strategy mm. of excellence and innovation. And what does that mean for the business? And from there, I developed my value proposition. And that's the value that procurement delivers not only to our end clients, but to the people who work within the procurement team, you know, how are they gonna have a better career experience? For the Lango Rock stakeholders in terms of what value does procurement deliver to the business? And actually for our supply chain, supply chain want an organization that they can rely on to do the right thing and that we can become an entrusted customer for our supply chain. So that was my approach to developing my set of objectives for the organization going forward. Thanks, Carol. Simon, share some of your views. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, from Mike's, I think Mike absolutely nailed it actually. Um, and he, you know, from a, for me, there's a big piece about relevance and, and you know, the, the whole piece around actually, um, if only I knew what I know now, um, yeah. and rewound my career 20 years, I'd probably um, have a lot less ang a lot less angst and a lot more um, potentially achieved. But you, you learn from your mistakes and we all bear scars of trying to, um, probably trying the wrong way to be relevant and therefore not picking your conversation and not picking the topic and not thinking about actually what matters most to the business that you're within. Um, you know, dependent on kind of proximity to where you report and actually um, when you think about kind of um, the risk, the categories that you may be responsible for, there's always a piece about relevance of category to the business. And sometimes, you know, the reality is the CEO will probably be a little bit more interested in things that are going to ultimately impact the top line. And therefore, you know, I've, I've uh, there's, an, uh, there's, a, there's an old story around kind of, um, I won't name names of, 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 of the actual uh, company, but um, the adage, which is real men don't buy paper clips if you're working with uh, indirect procurement. Um, and you kind of go, actually, you know, indirect procurement can be a significant proportion of the business's spend. And therefore, you still need to think about, you know, what's, how do I make this relevant to the importance of the business? It might not be, you know, for example, within Whitbread, we've got food supply chains, we've got physical supply chains to move the food. So I've you know, I get into lots of relevant conversations around that, but there's a lot of other category areas that are just as important. Um, and when you start looking at some of the indirect spend as well, it's, it's how, do you, how do you kind of position your narrative and actually kind of go, actually, look, this is really important to how we operate. And therefore for me, you know, remaining relevant, really good communication and alignment to, you know, the fundamental objectives of the business, it comes back to, you know, do those basics brilliantly. Like I said, if I knew some of this 20 years ago, you know, I'd, uh, I'd probably be a little bit more, you know, I might even be further ahead in my career, I don't know, <laughs> but um, I, I would like people to worry a little bit less around, you know, I must be talking to the CEO, I must be talking to the COO, you know, actually, you know, just think about what matters most for the business and it, it kind of works its own way through. So, um, you know, be a little bit confident and trust your instincts and, you know, master your kind of area, I would suggest. 
Yeah, and you mentioned, you touched on there um, about um, reporting lines. And um, I wondered if, um, Mike, you think it's important that, um, you know, should we be overly concerned about reporting into the CEO, having a seat on the board, um, or is just our, our relevance and having good advocates, uh, you know, more important? Well, um, I think it very much depends on on the organisation. Actually, I mean, um, I'm I'm probably the least hierarchical person you'll ever meet. So, um, you know, I, I I don't put a lot of weight on reporting lines because I think for a business to succeed, it's about teams actually working together, and that's difficult because if we think about most businesses coming out of the industrial revolution back in the day, you know, started off in a hierarchical fashion, and it was very much control and command you know, we're the bosses and we'll tell you what to do. Um, over time, we've, we've, we've come into the 70s and 80s and we've started to think about what a matrix organization can look like. And as businesses have become internationalized and economies of scale become real, you have to find the right balance between being relevant within the markets by which you operate, but also you have to find those economies of scale to, to centralize activities, you know, where it makes sense to do so. And I think that that question there is, is more the, the challenge. It's, you know, what type of organization do we want to be? Because it's not only a procurement problem. It's no different to, as I said, it's no different to you know, driving digital transformation. It's no different to driving um, um, you know, uh, consolidation of marketing activities where it makes sense to do so. You know, it really comes down to having some challenging conversations about why we need to operate the way we need to operate. I think um, to take Carol's point though, you know, it starts with knowing your stakeholders. You know, in any business, in any role, if you know you're ultimately only as good as the team around you, and there'll be team, there'll be the direct team, and there'll be the indirect team, and I and I just think as leaders, we we still often think about what we own and what we're accountable for, rather than the outcomes that we're trying to deliver. And if we think more about the outcomes that we're trying to deliver, whether that be for the customer, whether it be for the PNL, then it helps you to understand well who who is going to be part of of my movement because it's about creating movements in businesses. How do, how do I motivate and inspire people to be part of my movement that's gonna go and do some really exciting stuff and, and make amazing happen? So look, I, I, I don't think it's about hierarchy, um, but I do think that you've gotta have an executive sponsor that is championing, championing the importance of it. If not, you will end up with the, with the power and dominance of where the power and the dominance in a business sits, which often is the local p &L and business owners um, you know, saying, well, I'll use you as a central function where I can see value. If not, I'll do it myself. Uh, you know, and I, and I think that's got to change. I think we've got to find a much more, um, you know, a much more collaborative way that takes trust, you know, and it, and it takes a huge amount of humility for teams to come together. And I think different companies are at different stages of their evolution on that journey. Mm. I think all businesses will have to evolve to modern <clears throat> where it becomes not about hierarchy and more about, you know, collective working. But I think you have to understand to begin with, where are you as a company? You know, and if you're still in a very, you know, more old world hierarchical state, it's probably going to be a little bit more difficult sometimes to break down those barriers than if you're in a much more fluid, you know, uh, Netflix environment where everybody's kind of, you know, working together irrespective and there are no, there are no bosses. And so, you know, it's not easy. It's a complex topic. but hopefully It that. is very much so. And, and um, uh, on that point about where you are in your journey, I guess, Carol, um, the construction sector has has um, really gone under some quite dramatic changes over the last few years. Um, and uh, incidents such as the Grenfell Tower tragedy um, has really raised the importance of of, um, of procurement. Have, have you seen changes in your organisation and across the sector? Hugely, yes. You know, um, there were some very profound findings that came out of the Grenfell inquiry. Um, not everyone on the call may be familiar with the circumstances of the tragic loss of life resulting from a fire in a high-rise high building. Um, I won't go into the details of the inquiry. I'm not qualified to. Looking at the findings coming out of the report and the subsequent draft building and fire safety acts that are, are currently going through Parliament, um, one of the key things that we can do as procurement um, representatives is to really make sure that we understand the competency of our team. And when I say of our team, again, it's of all the stakeholders. You know, the procurement has, procurement organisation has a part to play in all of that. But without the 
technical capability, the quality assurance, the safety management systems. We all under, need to understand how we work together to assure ourselves that we have the competence and we have the right practice within the organisation to never see a tragedy like that again. So there's a, a huge effect that has come out of that. And it's a, a focus that we have to not just mark our own homework, but to benchmark. So, you know, I'll, I'll sing the praises of SIPs because that has given us a benchmark to say, if we have people accredited to SIPs through MSIPs or FSIPs, then that gives us a benchmark. If we can accredit our business processes to the SIP standard, then again, it gives us a benchmark and it helps us make sure that we have all of those good practices in place. And that in turn, you know, for a, an organization, for our CEO, back to the question that we started with and for our clients, it gives a degree of confidence then that we are doing the right things going forward and that we are managing the risk accordingly. Yeah, good point. We've had a question in from one of our um, listeners today, so it kind of links with that, because, I mean, that must have formed a large part of your corporate organisation-wide strategy in terms of reforming uh, and re-looking at the way you do things. Um, uh, Simon, what are your experiences on, on how procurement can make sure they're a part of that organisation-wide strategy and, and be a, a, as a, pri a bigger priority, if, if not the same priority, as, as other areas of the business? Yeah, I, th I think um, sit situation always plays into this, doesn't it? So if you kind of took, um, I mean, the, the COVID current climate, you actually go, you, you almost put a bit of a lens over the functions that are, you know, really required to kind of step in and support and um, so you know nobody wants to continue to trade in the crisis but uh, I think I've said it a couple of times before it's been an exceptional time to demonstrate the value of procurement supply chain during this period um, and and you know from my viewpoint as, as a business we've we've been much more agile in the way that we operate and the decision making process and therefore some of the things that we're going to make sure that you know stick and remain are the fact that you know, those behaviours don't fall away. And equally, the way that I encourage the team to continue to challenge and push with regards to helping to, you know, fundamentally drive our business forward, that, that pace remains. And the confidence to continue to challenge remains as well. Um, I think it's, you know, it's one of those situations, it's, it's within our gift to make sure we're super clear around the purpose of the function. And we, I think we sometimes agonise too much over actually what, you know where we fit and how you know kind of uh, what's the best way to put it um you know our identity you know it's i think as a as a function if we're really clear and i come back to the point i made at the start you know if we're really clear around actually how we can best support the organization and link to what we need to achieve as an organization the rest tends to look after itself so yeah that's a bit uh, not trying to be too 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 soft about it but it's just i think you've just got to be laser focused on the purpose Absolutely. Uh, so moving on, I mean, we all we've talked about this briefly about what procurement is perhaps traditionally known for and, and how we, we really want to kind of raise the bar on on some of that. Um, you know, we all know that we're vital for um, savings, but recent events such as COVID have really shone a light on the risk in supply chains. Um, what are all those other value adding activities that we should really be shouting about to get the attention? I mean, Mike, you said earlier, it, um, procurement, you don't really notice it while things, you know, because things are probably swimming along. But how can we shout out about some of those really great value adding things that we're, we're, we're contributing to to the business and, and what are some of those examples Mike do you want to go first for some of that yeah sure um, look I think you can look at it two ways um, the first is you know the world is moving faster now than it's ever moved um, you know and the the need for us to be able to pivot um, and to move at, at absolute pace um, is critical um, for two reasons one because you know it, it, there is so much disruption and so you know we have to make um, decisions in order to create sustainable um, services and service continuity for our customers um, but equally you know as, as you've rightly called out you know we, we have to keep ensuring that we're making sure that we uphold quality you know and making sure we're sourcing from um, from viable sources in all instances so you know th there is there is the ability of speed um, combined with the need for us to make sure that there is really strong due diligence and governance 
And those two things don't always come together. Um, and I think that's a real challenge uh, for procurement because we've got to be, be able to pivot and shift much faster than ever before. Um, but equally, we need to make sure that we're, we're even more stringent in terms of you know, some of that governance that, that we need. Um, I think what we have to do is look at um, where, what are the wins? You know, I'm, I'm a big believer that, you know, don't try and boil the ocean. Find, you know, two or three, you know, really great wins that you've achieved with your stakeholders and then collectively celebrate it. You know, and during, during COVID, we've set up a, a newsroom um, across the business, um, you know, because we recognize that it's hard when people are remote working as well, you know, to keep everybody communicated to. And in that newsroom, it's the idea is, is that any story that comes in, um, in, in one day, we'll get it out to the business the next day. And, and that's all about celebrating success, talking about how we're collaborating, talking about what we're doing to support the business and to support customers and suppliers through, through COVID-19 and beyond. But it's created a, a real urgency and pace um, and it's created an environment where actually communication is happening very, very readily. And I think you know, what you've got to find is what are the vehicles for, for communication? How do you celebrate those successes? But not as a procurement team, Actually, what you want is the business celebrating the success and then recognizing procurement as a critical part of that success. And I think that's where, you know, take technology, you know, I mean, we've managed to get thousands of people remote working, um, you know, very, very rapidly back in mm. April around the world. Uh, that would not have been possible without our technology team. No one really talks too much about the technology team, you know, until something goes wrong, you know. <laughs> We've gone out of our way to make sure that those teams that work tirelessly around the clock at weekends, you know, to, to provide that um, that ability, um, we've done. But it's it's the business celebrating the technology team, and you know what that's done? It's made them part of the business. It's yeah. taken them from being a silo, and it's made them part of the business. So again, Carol called it out. It comes back to that stakeholder management, and and, and if you can get those real sponsors and those evangelists across the business and statistics will say that you need between 20 to 30 percent of people being evangelists for something for it to become um, sticky across the organization so don't try and get 100 percent of evangelists yes. over the 20 percent and you might find um, that you make some real progress but stick to a few things and celebrate them well oh, good advice there um carol um i know that you get involved with um the bid side and the client side quite a lot in, um, at lang o'rourke can i explore some of that what you do there yeah we are involved right from the um early days and and a lot of effort goes in very early on in terms of shaping our procurement strategies so bringing together the strategies around our category management approach and then looking at how we can bring that in for best effect into our projects. Um, you know, what procurement can really help with with an organisation is hitting that sweet spot of make buy or self delivery outsource, whatever language you might use. And we can act as a, a challenge within the business to say, I know we have a great capability, but could we take it outside? Um, particularly around this whole space of digital engineering and technology developments and so on. Uh, because I think you have to be honest about what your core business capabilities are. If you're a construction organisation, do you necessarily have the full suite of technology smarts that another sector might be able to bring in? So we get involved very early on challenging the, the make buy decisions when there is a decision around that which we're going to go out to market with putting together the procurement strategy bringing in the insights that we'll get through category management um, making the most of the relationships that we have in terms of bringing the capability and capacity um, forward across all of the projects that we have going on so that we have the right balance and um, and then ultimately obviously shaping a response to a client whose answers may be driven around cost, as you might find in, in some industries more than other, but more often these days around the whole sustainability agenda and making sure that the answers that we give, as I say, a lot of what we do goes to supply chain. So a lot of what we rely on for our clients, particularly around sustainability, has to be what is the supply chain bringing in in response to that. Uh, so yeah, very actively engaged. And I've seen more and more bids like asking for what um, social value um, can be delivered through the supply chain. Um, and, and you're having more and more of those conversations with your suppliers about that. 
Absolutely. Um, in fact, I was talking to someone the other day and there are some parts of the supply chain that you wouldn't think that there could be an answer in that respect. You know, it just looks so um, such a problem area, but but the supply chain is thinking really creatively about, OK, my core product may not be very environmentally friendly, but how do I move my core product? Could I use electric vehicles? You know, what do I what materials do I use to create that core product and how can I make that more of a sustainable answer and so on? So very definitely um, we're seeing a lot more of that conversation going on around the supply chain and then in answer to our clients' questions. Excellent. And Simon, I know that um, you, you've changed how how your your procurement team is is measured really in terms of success and different areas of the business that you get involved with and they actually have a, a, a you have a KPI on them um, or a measure on um, revenue too can I explore some of that yeah no absolutely so more, more recently and um, because I look after the food so from a category viewpoint um, it's uh, it's all of the indirect kind of categories as well as all of the direct categories so kind of the food and beverage um, from an F&B perspective, when you look at um, the drink side, it's a category that can be kind of naturally managed a bit more as an end-to-end, -end, almost a typical retail category. Um, so through kind of some of the recent restructuring that we've completed, um, the opportunity was to actually say, look, let's look at end-to-end -end category management beyond just typical procurement, kind of managing the cost and the cost base and the suppliers and the supplier risk and everything that goes with that. But actually, to your point, how can we now start to look at driving top line from a revenue perspective. So we are now um, responsible for effectively looking at range, looking at how you, um, you know, physically set the bar, what the product, you know, what the product, um, how you set it up, how you market it, how you, how you really drive you know, sales from a top line perspective. So you, you, you move from just typical procurement, um, kind of we're driving cost, which is one dimensional through to actually how can you drive value through other, through other areas. That also then kind of takes into account the supply chain piece, which is availability, it's waste. You start looking holistically at the total category to really drive effectively profit and margin, which starts to become a very more, you know, very different conversation when you look at total, total kind of cost control. I think um, Carol's point around kind of risk management as well. You know, we, you start the relevance of risk management and the relevance of responsible sourcing. You know, they are just so, so super relevant, especially at the moment. Um, and it's kind of been magnified at the moment, but as you kind of move through this period, managing risk and then cost to the business that if you need to change. So if we had, we had, if we had issues with, I don't know, let's say our bed, you know, that's a core part of the room. And if we can't get that product and we can't produce it uh, and we can't get it into rooms, you suddenly get to a point that, you know, customer satisfaction starts to get absolutely impacted. And that's, you need to start, and I think Mike mentioned it earlier, it's kind of focus on customer value as opposed to just purely from a, a cost base perspective, kind of managing managing cost. Um, yeah, thinking kind of beyond that as well as what other areas can you drive revenue? So Carol kind of touched on EV. You know, one of the areas we're looking at is what other ancillary benefits um, can we drive through um, utilizing our estate differently. So for example, we use Amazon lockers uh, on our sites. It drives revenue, but it also drives a customer experience and a customer offer. And one of the areas that we've, we've looked at most recently um, is electric vehicle charging and how, you know, beyond again, just um, providing customer and offer in relation to EV charging, it's actually about how can we help electrify the UK? We've got 850 hotels in the UK Part of the problem with electric vehicles is range, and therefore consumers are nervous about, you know, buying an electric vehicle and going green, and therefore being more sustainably, you know, and ethically kind of a, you know, appropriate in the vehicle choice. And therefore, you start to go the total proposition, and the purpose, and the outcome, which Mike mentioned earlier. Once you're clear on the outcome, you can start to really drive value in different ways. Great, thank you. And um, we've had a, a question in from um, one of our, the audience as well, which I think is this a good one to explore. Is about, do you think that we've we've seen a shift change in procurement, and therefore, do you think um, that we need to tweak and and recalibrate some of our skills that are required to make sure make sure that we remain relevant over the next um, five, ten years, whatever that might be? Simon, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah. I, 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 I think we've got to be prepared to continue to evolve. So 
from a training development and personal kind of investment in your own skills, definitely we've got to be thinking about it. But it comes back to, you know, how can we, because the skills to manage a category such as drinks end to end is is probably slightly different from what commercially you would be considering when you're looking at a pure procurement kind of approach to it. So um, my view would be is look at opportunities in your business where you can start to take more responsibility, where you think you can take that responsibility, build a compelling reason, and then understand where those skill gaps are. So from a drinks viewpoint, now I need to make sure I've got commercially savvy individuals that can build a really good category that looks across all of the all of the all of the costs values, you know, all of the cost and the value levers and opportunities across that category to drive the right outcome, which is effectively we want to drive top line sales in drinks, but we also want to do it really, really well, not drive lots of ways to get the customer proposition absolutely bang on, as well as control cost, risk, et cetera, from a procurement viewpoint. So you start to kind of open that. So therefore there will be a need to plan early kind of those those gaps that may exist from a from a skills perspective because they're not they're not your typical procurement skills um but the, but we've also got a lot a lot of those skills in our toolbox i just don't think we sometimes use them all yeah <laughs> no I, I, I think we're brilliant you know you look at procurement and how many areas in a business we touch yeah but sometimes i don't think we always tap into them all as much as we possibly could yeah and i don't think it's anything new it's perhaps a, a, a reinvigorated focus perhaps and and carol we've talked before um you know and and through the the other construction leaders about the this increased need to be more agile and more collaboration and with that perhaps comes a, a refocus of skills have, have you seen um I know, I know that the construction sector have been collaborating quite a lot during this time during the covid situation if you want can we explore some of that yeah, and I think um, going through the COVID experience, I think we have to be honest with ourselves about, as a nation, this isn't being critical of each of our organisations, but nationally, how well prepared were we for a pandemic? So then you take it to a business level, how good was our business continuity planning? And actually, how did we respond to COVID? And if I was sat in the supply chain today, I would have been absolutely fatigued by lots of different organizations asking very similar questions in very different ways. And so what we've tried to do is to walk in the shoes of our supply chain and say, let's work together and let's get to that common question set and let's approach supply chain once and just find out where do they think that the risks are because the next thing on our doorstep is Brexit. So let's get together and say, are we concerned about any of the goods or services coming into the country? Um, and let's get a holistic answer and let's just share the awareness across the industry and show some more joined up thinking. We're also trying to move the industry forward. We can parochially say, don't worry, you know, we've learned a lot from the tragedy of Grenfell and we're doing the right thing within our own business, but let's get together as an industry and do the right thing as an industry and let's look at some of those better practices. So if we can make the construction process safer and reduce the risk to people at work by taking it off site and putting it in a safer factory environment, again, how can we join up as an industry and say, what are the learning points from there around standardization and, and common ways of working and so on? So there will always be competition but if, at least if we start with a framework, we can take the edge over each other, let's be honest, because, you know, we are in business. Um, but at least we'll have that common framework, which as an industry will raise the bar for the industry, which will raise the bar for our clients and for the general public who are using the, the projects, the buildings, the infrastructure that we're delivering to the nation. Excellent. And, and Mike, are you seeing uh, the need for more agile and um, collaborative skills? Yeah, and Carol's dropped the, the B word there, Brexit, COVID, whatever it might be. We've got to be more fleet of foot as, as, uh, as organisations and as procurement teams um, right the way through to our supply chain. Yeah, there's some great questions actually on, on responsiveness that I've been reading. I've, I've tried to respond to a few of them uh, as we've been going. Multitasking is quite <laughs> difficult when you're listening and typing at the same time. Um, you know, again, I'd, I'd look at this um, in, in two areas. I think um, yeah, the, the reality is that every business that, that you are in 
is at risk of being disrupted. You know, every business, you know, is at risk of becoming irrelevant. You know, that, that's just a fact. And if you look, if you look at the Fortune 500 today and look at them 10 years ago, look at them 20 years ago, things are shifting really quickly. You know, I can imagine in Simon's world, you know, who knew what was what was just about a hit? And you know, think about the hospitality industry. I mean, it's 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 tragic what's happening. You know, say the same with um, aviation. Um, you know, it's it saddens us all to see the impact in in across. But what it does mean is that you know we've got to be constantly thinking outside in. And I and I would I would see that the procurement teams and those that are engaging primarily with our suppliers and with our partners that are hugely important to gathering intelligence and information about what's happening in the market to inform our strategy. We all think a strategy is by five years, it's locked down and it's done. I guarantee that you know, strategy in this day and age probably is, is good for 12 months and then you've got to review it again. You know, we, we, we've, got, we've got such a speed of change. Uh, you know, they, they say at the moment, you know, even with COVID, that you know, a, a week in the business now is, is a month in the business before in terms of digitization, in terms of speed, in terms of pace. Um, and so, you know, we've got to be, we've got to create a culture, you know, not just in procurement, but I think within procurement is critical where, you know, there's a curiosity, there's a, there's a softer skill set, which is, you know, I'm going to be curious. I'm going to find out what's happening in the market. I'm going to listen to what the suppliers are telling us. I'm, I'm understanding how are they thinking about their supply chain changing? You know, we've got suppliers today who you know, could arguably stand up a website if they wanted to and start to and, and start to you know, disintermediate distribution channel. You know, it's the same in every single industry. And so, you know, getting people to think more commercially about what's happening in the world and then relating procurement and what we're doing in that regard to drive um, change and be able to move and pivot quickly is critical. And then, of course, the other skill which comes right behind that, which I think is increasingly important, is the, the soft interpersonal skills, the ability to influence, the ability to manage stakeholders really effectively, the ability to, to have a backbone, you know, and to stand up for what you truly believe in is going to help the business. And I think, you know, being characterful and having, you know, people within your teams that are not afraid to challenge, they're not afraid to have the tough conversations with business leaders. Yeah. You know, that's what I want. I want people that are going to bring an expertise and a, and, and a mindset and intelligence to me to help us to make the right decisions. I, I certainly do not have all the answers as a business leader. But what I need is I need people, not I don't need the leaders either. I need the people that are on the ground touching customers and suppliers every day, feeding that information in to inform strategy. Then we can succeed and not become irrelevant. Biggest problem in business, middle management. Because you know we, we get to that situation where it's the it's the bridge between the, the, the leadership and the people on the ground. And it's not a criticism of the middle management. Everyone's trying to do the right thing, but it's like a Chinese whispers game. Things come up and don't always come up the right way and things go down and don't always go down the right way. And I think we've got to try and fathom that as a business because it's going so quick and we've got to get intelligence now that's going to inform what we do tomorrow. It's, it's that quick we've got to be moving, I think. Absolutely, I totally agree with that. Um, and I guess what you measure is what you get sometimes. And um, uh, we've had a question in from Jane saying that often procurement is 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 um, placed within the finance team within an organisation, um, which which does subtly lead us to focusing on um, on spend and, and cost, etc. Right? Um, you know, is this a good or a bad thing? Or you know, are, are we are we responsible for our own destiny? Should we really be pushing for more than that? I don't know what your thoughts are, Simon. Whether you've got any we thoughts? On that. I'll definitely take that. <laughs> go on, go I'll for it. Pleasure. No, I'd, uh... <laughs> Where you report, I mean, I guess there's always going to be a lens that the individual you report into will might have a preference for certain <laughs> certain things. So finance, you know, they, they, you could typically say they may have a preference for driving the number. But, um, you know, I, I, I report into the group operations director and uh, what I what I see and what I feel um, is, a, is an amazing opportunity to be part of the business and build plans with the with the business and talk about relevance, um, you know, everything that's currently happened we've been absolutely in the middle of um i don't think the reporting line matters though if you get back to the points made earlier which is um and you've touched on it as well again mike which is curiosity you know you come back to going how can we be relevant how can we continue to be curious how can we continue to understand what matters most in the business in relation to
driving the right outcomes. And as long as you can build plans around that, then nobody, you know, and if you get blocked and if you get stopped, you think about how you're having your conversation and other ways you can get it there. And therefore there is a big piece around resilience as well, is you can get so many knockbacks and you can get pushed. And unless you kind of go, actually, no, I really believe in this. I completely believe in the principle of what I'm trying to do. I think it's right for the business. I think it absolutely is in response to your situation, the market and whatever else may be driving it. And therefore I need to get my voice heard. So I think once you get a bit of oxygen and, and Mike touched on it earlier, you know, you get people that support you. Um, I'm in a privileged position because we have got such good support in the business for our function procurement supply chain without procurement supply chain it's a lifeblood we will not deliver product you know we would if we don't run a physical if we don't have the sort of sourcing center in shanghai we don't get the product that we need for the rest of our business and it's all about how do you drive and continue to grow and develop and we're seen as an enabler for that and i think being passionate and being clear around your purpose if you can really get that boiled down into such a succinct way that people go i get it and actually, when you start getting asked for advice and counsel on things that are not related to procurement and supply chain, you suddenly go, ah, that's a really interesting place to be when you're asked for opinion and you're asked for view, because then it's, it's valued. So, you know, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot about resilience and curiosity and, um, yeah, drive, you know, it's very, very important. But reporting line, uh, if you allow it to stagnate you, then that's a personal choice. Um, if you continue, you know, I think you've got to be, you know, passionate about the function and passionate about the purpose and as soon as you do that that kind of tends to that tends to come through. Carol have you noticed that you know reporting lines have, have held a, a team back before or or do you share similar views? Yeah I, I don't see it as an inhibitor. Um, I, I once had a leader and he said you audition for your job every day you know we are ambassadors and um, many years ago I got involved in a diversity and inclusion program and I'm still part of that now whilst I'm at Lango Rock. Let's start with inclusion because diversity will follow. We all have to truly recognise the value that we each bring every day. Um, there is no, I, I saw a comment about the Downton Abbey, you know, the downstairs of procurement. That's not the case. This is a team sport. We have to be our ambassadors for the value that we deliver and we have to share that with the business. Um, there are lots of comms tools that businesses have. Use them. Share insights on Teams or Yammer or through your intranet or what have you. And just keep that information flowing. Um, show that you are a, an approachable, knowledgeable, capable person. And just keep communicating out to people to, to get them to connect with you. Uh, I've used a number of... Um, avenues through the organization to do that and to Simon's point just as a result I'm involved in so many things that are not strictly procurement related just because people have now connected with somebody that is prepared to help them with their problem solving uh, and not just myself personally but the team that I have around me within the procurement organization so we, we now are a you know a, a go-to organization to get the support that the business needs. So recognize your value, forget the reporting lines, be an ambassador, keep communicating. And we've had a few questions about if you come across barriers or, or resistance and, and, and how you would, um, what strategies you, you would perhaps use to overcome some of those. Perhaps someone wants to pick up that question first. Never, never come across a barrier in in. in <laughs> no, honestly, I don't. I do not believe that. No, 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 no and it's complete lie. You know, the reality, <laughs> the reality is, it, it, I think it comes back to relationships and how you have your conversation, um, and how you again come back to understanding, being really clear about what it is you you want to do and why, and therefore you know getting that advocacy and getting that kind of level of support. I mean. It's, the also reality check sometimes what you come up with isn't right at that point in time for the organization but it might be right again and you've got to keep kind of going back and understanding you know when something might be relevant so you know, the team at the moment we're starting to think we are thinking through kind of plans 21 22 and beyond albeit we're still kind of based heavily into the covid kind of current situation um but i'm kind of encouraging them to go look that the environment's changed things that might have been off the table before should be back on the table and everything's a discussion. So we need to be prepared to uh, come back a bit to resilience as well. 
is kind of not just accepting no you know not don't accept no you know it might be no for now but come back and rethink when it might be relevant again and if you're really really passionate about it maybe really think about how you package up your conversation we sometimes get too caught in our procurement lingo and i think we've got to simplify you know so some of the easiest conversations the biggest things that i've had kind of run through from an xco perspective have taken minutes and been waved through because actually you speak to people in advance you have a sensible conversation it gets around the xco table and everyone's in violent agreement and it doesn't take a huge doesn't always take a huge amount of science and a thesis to get things through it's, it's thinking a bit differently about how you kind of get that level of support and quite and but that does come with confidence so people will trust you more and be confident in what you're saying and yeah. allow that to happen so you do have to you've got to get a few wins over the line to get that level of confidence once you've got the confidence you know you can get things through and make things happen and that starts to get really exciting because people look at you and trust you uh, uh, you know as a function it's brilliant and carol how have you dealt with resistance or barriers uh, i think as simon says it's about relationships I think sometimes, let's be honest, you just do have to dig in a little bit. You know, people, there was an article on the 25th of October about, you know, procurement is the posh word for buying, basically. So let's be honest, everybody thinks they can buy. You know, we'll all, we'll all dial off the call and later this evening we'll start our Christmas shopping and we'll go on Amazon. We know exactly what we're doing. And so you kind of get that mentality. Um, if you can start with relationships and influence and so on, that's great. But every now and then you just have to take that tough love stance of actually there's a, a delegation of authority, there are reasons why we do what we do. Um, and sometimes people just aren't aware. So sometimes it's a lack of understanding. There are mavericks out there and they're probably not going to change their spots. So recognize that and do what you can to build a, a good team around them um, and build alliances as well when you find yourself in that situation where people are just not going to um, build the relationships and take the time. So build an alliance that says that it's not just you as a procurement organization trying to assert what needs to be done in an appropriate way within the business, but get your technical function alongside, get your commercial function alongside, you know, get others to actually build that compelling reason for people is to know actually we really do need to do it this way yeah Mike how how important is um ease of um doing business with procurement important and and do we always get that right and 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 what could we do to make it easier just to to deal with procurement on a day-to-day -day basis um I think ease of doing business full stop you know uh, can be difficult so again I I think there's sometimes a perception um, well, you have to start by saying what is procurement because it means different things in different businesses and I think that's a, a, a that by its nature causes confusion um, you know I had a great conversation with uh, a senior leader recently about sales and uh, and just a very strong perception about what what sales is and I said well, I don't share that view at all actually I, I think that you know this is about you know the relationships that we have with our customers it's the ability to be able to attract new customers to come and want to do business with us. And that's an art and a skill, which a lot of people just don't have. Um, you know, and that takes resilience. It takes determination. It takes, you know, amazing communication and influencing skills. Um, so, you know, if you, if you think there's people driving around still in cars, you know, sipping coffee and, you know, I think, I think you, you, you know, you need to get yourself into, into a modern mindset. Um, and, and I do think that, you know, there are, there are, you know, there are perceptions of, of procurement from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that need to be broken down. Um, so, you know, for me, I, I think that, you know, it, it's about how you set a procurement function up to be easy for people to do business with. You know, there has to be some level of governance and there's got to be some level of process that people need to follow, but they don't have to be bureaucratic. And to take Simon's point, you know, just come and talk to us and we'll come and talk to you and let's get to the answers before we have to go through you know, a 20 stage gated process for a decision, you know, you have a choice, you know, I think if you, you know, I'm a big believer as an engineer that you've got to have a process to do things, but you know, a process can have two steps. It doesn't need to have, you know, five steps. And we've just got to think about the practicalities of how we work. And when you've got, you've got the more complex the organization, you know, the, the simpler you've got to try and make things because you've just got so many different touch points. And I don't think we think that way. The business gets bigger. We put more processes in. We put more complexity in. We mm. put more 
red tape in and how do we break that down? So to start by um, explaining to people what procurement is and the value that it delivers and, and, and how it contributes to the outcomes that we're all trying to drive, which is for our customers, you know, ultimately. Um, and, and then I think it's about, you know, allowing people to have great experiences and then celebrate those experiences, even if you fail together, you know, celebrate them because it demonstrates that level of collaboration, which I think has come out very strongly from the panel. Um, but those, those would be my, my reflections. Um, you know, it's not easy working cross-functionally and, and uh, you know, in any business, you know, we've got to work hard at it, but it is mindset and we've got to break down those perceptions. So we've got new starters coming into a business. Let's say somebody from university is thinking about a career in procurement. What's their perception? Who's their mentor? Who's their coach? In an increasingly you know, technology-led world, you know, what is procurement going to become and how do we inspire the next generation of people to think about a career in procurement, that it's exciting, that it's, that it's cutting edge, that it's leading the way for businesses, that it's about having amazing relationships with our suppliers in ecosystems that, that it's going to contribute towards the success of the business. And we talk about sales side, supplier side in a business and then the, the machine in the middle. You know, this is right front and center on that supplier side. You know, it's just as important as the sell side, but people don't always see it that way. So, you know, there's a bit of positioning to do. Um, what you need is an evangelical leader somewhere in the Exco um, that can help to just, you know, reset, you know, what it is if it's not set up in the right way would be my counsel. Simon, have you had to work on ease of um, use of, of your team? Have you had to streamline processes or, or is it more of a hearts and minds type project? Um, <clears throat> from a from a from an organisational viewpoint, we kind of went through a bit of simplification following the sale of um, uh, Costa to Coca Cola. So that that kind of just forced the business to kind of go through a bit of thinking around structure and change. And what what it was what it, what we did deliberately was take a view on how can we make sure that we because there were too many spans and too many layers, too much you know. So spanner control was wrong. Layers were not right. Um, but in doing that, we also looked at kind of how do we, how do you make sure that you can continue to make decisions quickly, but also on the flip side, how do you build your plans together? So um, as gatekeepers to a degree, and it's a terrible word to use, but trying to channel planning is something that we've, we've done an awful lot of work on um, and specifically working with IT. So IT, the, the CIO is my peer reports into the group operations director, but between us, we are two kind of points of activity where our organization tends to come in. So you'll either come in because you require something, kind of you're working with procurement, or you come in because actually you've got an IT requ a requirement to change something, whether it's digital transformation, whether it's um, you know, booking platform change, et cetera. So you actually, the need, it's a really good point to kind of build our joint plans together. So from an IT and a procurement viewpoint, our plans are built collectively together because inevitably something will need so IT change and something will need procurement, supply chain, commercial and contract. So you kind of, there's, there's a putting simple things in place certainly have helped a stop maverick conversations going on, having a group where it actually you go through and you build your plans and that's one work plan. And then at Exco, if anything deviates away from that, you have to channel it in, but it's quite pragmatic, but it just has put a level of discipline around how you build a pipeline of activity for the business, not for procurement, not for IT, but what matters most for the business in relation to you know, key commercial changes, you know, from a supply perspective or key IT changes that we need to make, which inevitably have to come together. So, you know, that's, that's certainly been something that's been helpful. Brilliant. Right. We're about out of time. So I'm going to ask you in, in a nutshell to um, with people starting off on their journey, um, what would your one or two key areas to focus on be? What, what advice would you give people? I'm going to hand over to you, Mike, first okay. for that. So um, resilience, don't be afraid to fail. Um, you know, focus on a few things, you know, grab the wins quickly um, and celebrate them together with your business stakeholders and then go again and then go again. Uh, <laughs> oak, beautiful, beautiful oak trees, um, you know, came from um, small acorns, um, you know, and, and there's a lot of tough winters sometimes as well as some beautiful summers. And I think if you can uh, be resilient and follow that journey, you'll, you'll do very well. Great advice. Carol. Focus on the value that you can deliver every day. Um, don't see yourself as a subservient downstairs part of the organisation. Recognise on the value that you recognise the value that you can deliver. Excellent advice. And Simon, 
I, I'll come back to it and I think you kind of said it so be, for me it's the curiosity piece be curious yeah remain to focus on being relevant but be you know be passionate be yeah. absolutely passionate about the purpose of you know your function and what you can deliver and your well, role you've certainly all been passionate today so thank you very much for your great advice I hope I hope um, our listeners have found that very useful so thank you to all our panel thank you for joining us thank so that, thanks everyone that draws things to a close. Like I said, this is just uh, one in a series of seminars we're doing in partnership with RS Components. And right at the end, um, um, our registration details will pop up on how you can join those other seminars um, in the up and coming months. So thank you very much for joining today. Thank you for all your great questions and participation on chat. It was really great to see you all here today. Uh, and stay safe, everyone. <laughs>